Please join me in welcoming Nigel Zelser, co-founder and managing partner with JBN Consulting. Good morning. I'm Nigel Zelser, and I'm proudly representing JBN Consulting. Once again this year, we're platinum sponsors at the Georgia Technology Summit. You know, JBN was strategic management consultants. We believe innovation is a distinct competitive advantage. We partner with our clients, we deliver inspired solutions, and we help their business move forward. Today, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, Hal Gregerson. Hal is Executive Director at the MIT Leadership School and Senior Lecturer in Leadership and Innovation at the MIT Sloan School. He pursues his lifelong vocation of learning how leaders in business, government, and society discover provocative new strategies, develop the human and organizational capacity to realize those strategies, and ultimately deliver positive, powerful results. Uh, Hal's most uh, recent book, The Innovator's DNA, Mastering the Five Skills of Disruptive Innovators, uncovers the code for the successful innovator in business. Please join me in welcoming Hal Gregerson. Thank you very much. It is wonderful to be with you today. Last night I had dinner and some conversations with some great friends here in Atlanta, and I'm hoping to have a conversation, sort of, with you here today. How does that sound? Here we go. We're going to go back in time in my life first, and then back in time in an industry. So here's my life. In 1973, I was 15 years old. My parents gave me the first 35 millimeter camera that I ever had. This is the first picture I took with that camera. And trust me, I understand it's a stupid picture. It's not worthy of much of anything. But it's the first. I loved it. And then I started taking hundreds of pictures and then thousands of pictures. And then late in high school, I started my own little business of portrait and wedding photography. And that business ended up paying my way through college. It was a great sort of way to approach the thing. And then from that point forward, as an adult, I always walk around the world with a question in my mind, what's interesting? But this is some of those pictures I took back then. <laughs> it certainly dates me. Now you know how old I am. But as I go forward, I'm constantly trying to figure out what's interesting. And even now, I'm kind of figuring out images while I'm talking to you. Don't, don't get worried, but that's how I approach the world. When I was on the beaches of Bali, it's like, this is interesting, this light that washed up on the beach. Or when I was at a car show in Santa Fe, an owner let me get in the car, and like, this is interesting inside of here. And I then, last summer, did the most phenomenal thing, which was I collaborated with Santa Fe Photographic Workshops, a guy named Sam Abel from the National Geographic. We did a leadership through photography workshop where leaders learn how to be more innovative by taking pictures. And I'm telling you all of this because if I had lived in 1880, none of that would have ever happened. Because photography was not for the common people like me. It was something that professionals did, it was an expensive process. It was time consuming. Relatively few people had access to it. They had big, huge cameras that you could not carry around and take selfies with. It just wasn't an option. And so essentially, George Eastman lived at that point in time. He built the camera, the, the film mechanisms that went in the back of these cameras. He asked the disruptive question. How could someone like me, or a common person, take a camera anywhere to take a picture? He worked at it for several years, and then he devised a brownie box camera. In 1900, it was a cardboard box wrapped in black paper. It sold for one US dollar. It utterly disrupted the photography industry. And in Clayton Christensen's terms at Harvard on disruption, it transformed a complex, expensive process that very few people had access to into an inexpensive, fairly simple process that millions and then billions had access to. These kinds of ideas, whether they be then in 1900 or today here in Georgia, they create new markets. They create the most value. They're the kinds of innovative ideas that we all want to get. And I'm going to try to share with you how we do that. Back to Kodak now. My mother, after World War II, was in the Red Cross. 
She traveled through Europe, stopped in Paris, went and had her picture taken with a Kodak camera. It was a Kodak number three, which is a sustaining innovation, meaning you take a product or service, you make it a little bit better, and customers are a little bit happier with it. Nothing revolutionary, it just makes things a little bit better. These create value, not as much as a disruptive idea. Back to Kodak, 1963. Fujifilm comes to the US for the first time onto Kodak's territory where they were monopoly and they start selling film. And some of you are old enough as I am to remember when they started selling film, it was cheaper than Kodak film. Kodak instantly went to the US government. There's no way they can make film this cheap to sell it that cheap. 40 years of litigation later, the conclusion was consistently, no. Fujifilm just knows how to make film cheaper, Kodak. And so they then had to double down on a third kind of, of innovation, efficiency, in order to compete against Fujifilm. Now here's the major warning of the morning. The moment an individual, a team, an organization, or even a country starts funneling down their innovation efforts solely into that efficiency space, it's a dangerous moment when it marks the beginning of the end. And the end may not be for quite some time, but it is a moment. So fast forward, 1975. In Kodak Labs, they invented the first electronic camera. No internet, no computers, no PCs, no reason to trade these really cheap images, and so nothing gets done with it. Fast forward, 2005. I joined then a, a university in France called INSEAD, and I wanted to go to the to the same place where my mother had had her picture taken in Paris. What kind of camera did I use? It was a Kodak camera. It was a Kodak electronic camera, and they had a multi-billion dollar, highly successful business at that point. Six years, seven years later, 2012, our daughter was an au pair in Paris. She then wanted her picture taken where her grandmother had been in 1949. What kind of camera was it? You've got it, it's a phone, an iPhone. <laughs> it's a story that's not just Kodak's story. I lived in Finland for three years. It's Nokia's story, and the list goes on and on. And here's the deal. The disruptor for Kodak in 1900 becomes the disrupted. And I loved what you said, that Jeff Bezos said, which is, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. For not only individuals, but companies, every day we wake up, either we're doing things that help us disrupt the industry we're in, or we're doing things that lead us to be disrupted. And it's all in the doing. That's the conclusion from our book, The Innovator's DNA. It's what we do during the day that makes all the difference. Jeff Dyer and I went to Clayton Christensen. We said, Clay, you are the author. You coined the term disruptive innovation. And we asked him, how did people like Jeff Bezos do it? How did they get that idea? And Clay's a strategy faculty, and he's like, I'm not quite sure how they got the idea. All I know is they got it, and it worked. And here's how it worked. And we're like, well, let's figure it out. So we ended up interviewing Jeff Bezos, Mark Benioff at Salesforce.com, Peter Thiel at PayPal, Nicholas Zenstrom who founded Skype. Several of those are disruptive businesses in their own industry. Have any of you ever shadowed a leader for a half day or a day? Just watch them do their work. Anybody? Raise your hands. Got a few hands going up. Did you get some good insights from doing that? You do when you watch these people. Now, we didn't have the luxury of watching them, but we heard their stories about what they were doing. And what we discovered was you could see the actions they were taking on a daily basis that enabled them to get the ideas that changed the world. It's just doing stuff that we have to learn how to do. And that's what makes them so innovative. Now, I have a question before I tell you what that stuff is, what those skills were that they relied on to get those great ideas. Are innovators born or are they made? If you go back to these people, were they born that way? Or does, you know, is it nature versus nurture? Do they have the genetics or is it just the world they grow up in, the schools they go to, the companies they're in? Nature versus nurture. I'm gonna give your tables 30 seconds to do a quick polling. What's your decision? Is it more nature, more nurture? More nature, more nurture, go. It's 30 seconds. What's your conclusion?
Okay. I told you it was quick. <laughs> we're done, we're ready, we're back. I, don't, I just wanted a quick polling. Were any tables in complete agreement? Everybody was on the same page. So we got a few tables. There was a fair amount of disagreement. Here's the deal. Let's pretend you're my top team. You know, I've got two, four, six, seven. Oh, you are my top team, that's right. I'm fired, right? <laughs> um, so here we go, five or six people. If I believe it's all nature, and my boss comes to me and says, we need some innovation going on around here. If it's nature, what's my job? Who's got it? So like, you've got it, sorry, you don't. You've got it, you don't, you've got it, you don't. So three of you help me get innovative and the other three take a vacation in Florida or something. But anyway, that's pushing it to the extreme. I get it. If it's all nature, it's all selection and we're done for the day because either we have it or we don't. But the data from five or six research studies of genetically identical twins where they're born identically, genetically, but then for a variety of reasons, they're separated at birth, grew up in different families. You look at their creativity and innovation skills when they're adults and about one third of their innovation capacity is indeed genetic. Are any of you like the kind of person when you were a kid that was always touching stuff, grabbing things? You probably had more dopamine four in your head. It makes your hands just sort of explore. You do stuff, it's the way it works. But it's only one third. The other two thirds is the environment we grow up in and the environment that we work in. So real quick thing around this born that way. Four-year-olds, what do four-year-olds do all the time? They ask a thousand questions, right? Do they try stuff all the time? Are they really good observers? Do they watch the world well? So we're a merger and acquisition family. I had three, she, has, she had four, and we now have seven. So you know, now we have seven kids, and we have six grandkids. So one of our kids the other day was driving down the road with our granddaughter in the back seat, Coco. Coco's in the back, and off they go. They go through a McDonald's drive through They get a Happy Meal with a little doll inside. Coco in the back seat's about four years old. She's got her hand out the window with the doll. You know, you're a kid, you love to have the wind blowing, and the ball, she's just having fun. And her mom says, Coco, if you keep doing that, you're gonna lose that doll. Coco just doesn't listen, keeps holding the doll out. What happens? You know, wind catches it, doll's gone. Her mother says, no more dolly. Coco's like, ah! she's screaming, you know, crying, all that kind of stuff. Two or three minutes later, Coco settles down. And she notices her mother's cell phone sitting between the two front seats. And so she grabs it with, without her mother knowing it. And she holds it out the window. <laughs> And at this point, she's in total stealth mode. It's like, okay, I'm gonna wait until she's looking. And her mother turns around and she tosses the cell phone. And her mother's like, oh. and Coco says, no more cell phone. <laughs> I'm like dead serious. It's like, really, it's exactly what she did. So here's the deal. Four-year-olds everywhere in the world that I go, they ask lots of questions, they're good observers, they talk to about anybody, they try stuff, they totally think differently, don't they? How many of us were once four years old? <laughs> we all were, right? And so if we don't see ourselves as innovators, it's time to change that tune. How many of you are innovators? Raise your hands, please. Okay, about half the room is up. If this were a group of four-year-olds, how many hands would be up? How many of you solve problems? Okay, you're, you know it's a setup, right? If you don't know the answer to a problem, you've got to get a creative solution. I don't care whether we call it innovation or creative problem solving, it's the same stuff. And that's what we're gonna talk about, how can I do it better? Here we go. And here's the stuff. These folks, we, we took these interviews of these people like Jeff Bezos, Distilled it down, they were doing five things. Questioning, observing, networking for new ideas, experimenting, and associational thinking. We put that into a survey assessment. We collected data from over 10,000 leaders around the world, and the data are convincing. All you have to do is do it enough, and you've got the probabilities in your favor. You're gonna get new businesses, new products, new services, new ideas that are valuable. So here we go. Number one, they think differently. 
They really do. I'm going to show you a video of exactly what I mean by thinking differently. How many have seen Lindsay Sterling videos before? Okay, here's the story. She grew up as a little girl learning first how to play the violin. Any violinists in the room? It's a, not an easy instrument to learn, but she, she figured it out and she became very good at it. Then she learned how to dance and then she got the idea. What if I played the violin while I'm dancing? So then she mastered tunes and then she could put the dance to it and she got into America's Got Talent. And she got to the quarterfinals, and then she got booted off. And, I, and it's amazing to hear what Piers Morgan told her when she was kicked off the show. He said, you're not untalented, Lindsay, but you're not good enough to get away with flying through the air and playing the violin at the same time. Piers Morgan could not jump categories. He couldn't get out of somebody doing one or the other and both. He just couldn't see, think, see that way. And so, it was about four months after that, a videographer called Lindsey Sterling and said, I think you're good. Let's make a video. And so they did. And it was the top 10 of all the videos that year on YouTube. And if you go to her YouTube site now, this is about a seven month old screen capture with the five million subscribers. She's close to seven million subscribers now and her site has close to 800 million views. It's the Lindsay Sterlings of the world who are disrupt, disrupting the monetizing strategy of old media companies. She's making a lot of money on her own. So here we go. Here's how they think differently. Einstein called it combinatorial play. Steve Jobs called it connecting the unconnected. Whatever it is, we call it associational thinking. You put two things together, that, or three things that you normally wouldn't put together. Kids do it all the time, and innovators as adults do the same thing. One of our daughters worked for Doctors Without Borders in Dubai for a number of years. And here was the issue. As Doctors Without Borders, they go into usually civil war or war zones. They're trying to heal people and do surgery on them. And the problem is, it's a war zone. You don't have hospitals. And they're trying to figure out, how could we get an instant hospital? And they're wrestling with this because it matters to them. And here's what they figure out. Somebody sees an inflatable toy, makes the connection. What if we made an inflatable hospital? Two or three years later, that's what they did. It's on a crate, you drop it in the space, you put the, the air inside of it, poosh, and you've got an instant hospital. That's what I'm talking about, connecting the unconnected. And so here's my question to you. We call it associational thinking. Where do you get your best ideas? Physically, where are you? Shower? Car? In bed? Running? Not at work? <laughs> Bathroom, shower, you know, you know, the list goes on, right? So, if you're trying to get a new idea, what should you do? Take more showers, go running more. I am not kidding, Diane Green at VMware, she's the co-founder of VMware, which is software behind the software in most computer systems on the face of the earth. 
Diane grew up near Chesapeake Bay. Her parents taught her how to go sailing. As a kid, she learned to sail on her own. As an adult technical engineer, computer systems analyst, she hits a brick wall. She's stuck. She's trying to get an answer. What does she do? She goes sailing alone, just to think and let it figure it out. Second question is, where, before we get to that one, where does your team get its best new ideas? Most leaders, unfortunately, kind of stumble on that one, which kind of indicates they're probably not getting new ideas. I don't mean that in a mean way, because contrast that with leaders who are consistently getting new ideas, like at Cirque du Soleil. You've seen some of the shows. Great, innovative stuff. Danielle Lamar, the CEO, I was talking with him in Montreal a couple of years ago, and I said, Danielle, where at Cirque du Soleil do people get their great new ideas? He instantly said, go to the cafeteria. You go to the cafeteria. It's this beehive of conversation. Backstage people talking with performers. Traveling show people talking with permanent show people. Staff, admin people talking with the people on the stage. And it's those kinds of conversations that help them keep it alive. So first point about associational thinking is you've got to jump categories, and you've got to create the space to do it for yourself and your team. Next we go. That's how they think differently. But guess what? It's not all about our head. It's about we think differently because we act differently. And here's how they act differently. They ask different questions that are catalytic. They ask questions that are uncomfortable to the people who are comfortable with the status quo. They question everything. SAP founder Hassel Plattner told me last year, every morning I wake up wondering how many things I'm dead wrong about. That's an interesting way to wake up in the morning. <laughs> but that's what they do. It's like, what am I wrong about? What's working? What's not? And why? And I'm pursuing that, trying to figure it out. David Neeleman, who founded a series of, of airline companies ranging from Morris Air that he sold to Southwest Airlines, he got fired from Southwest Airlines after six months of working there because he was too innovative. He pushed the status quo too far at one of the most innovative companies in the world. Then he goes and he builds JetBlue, and then he goes down to Brazil where he was born, and he builds Azul Airlines. And when he was just, I mean, a little part of, uh, of Neeleman is he's constantly asking questions. Listen to him tell a bit of his story. Yeah. Why do we do things the way we do? Just every single thing that we do doesn't make sense. Why is it being done? Is it tradition? Is that how to think on your picture, too? We'll, make, you know, well, we'll skip it then. I don't know what's going on there. Here's the deal. David is always asking, why not, why not, why not? So let me give you a quick example. Here's the example, which is you've got them setting up Azul Airlines in Brazil. They couldn't get landing slots at the regular airport close to, uh, to um, Sao Paulo. And so they had to go to an airport an hour away. And they started getting planes leased and bought and schedule set up and everything. And like six, nine months before it was actually going to launch, here's what they discovered. The taxi fare from downtown Sao Paulo to the airport an hour away on average cost more than the airfare. <laughs> it's like, oh man, what are we going to do? And David and others are thinking about it. And David finally goes, well, why don't we just like make a massive bus feeder system to bring tens of thousands of people from Sao Paulo to the airport? And his CFO and the rest of the team, what did they say? <laughs> no, David, we don't do things like that. That's not what airlines are into. David's response, why not? It's that notion, prove it to me, we can't and we shouldn't. And he ended up then building this massive bus feeder system, and it's been key to their success in Brazil. So the issue is what's working, what's not, and why. These are critical. The important and difficult job of leaders is to never find the right answers. Trust me on this one. Trust Peter Drucker on this one. It's to find the right questions. And then he said, there's nothing more dangerous than the right answers to the wrong questions. People who get disrupted and companies who are the same, they're asking the wrong questions. But the issue is, how do you ask the right question? So anybody in here got a challenge or an opportunity that you don't have a solution to right now? How many? Raise your hands, please. Everybody, right? Whenever we're stuck, it's because we're asking the wrong question or we get unstuck. So let me share with you a methodology that can instantly unstick your problem for yourself or your team in four fast minutes. Here's what you do. Challenge, you've got it. 
Second thing, you ask nothing but questions. And if you don't follow these following two rules, the next thing I'm gonna say, it will not work. Number one, you've got a group of people together or yourself, you do not answer your questions. What's the leader's knee-jerk response to a question? Answer it, don't. It's not the time. And if I were to say any questions from the audience and someone stands up at this mic over here, sometimes people stand up at the mic and they talk for 15 minutes before they ask the question. You know what I'm talking about? Don't do that either. Don't preface your questions, don't answer your questions. Brainstorm nothing but questions. So we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it around this issue. I just don't have time to innovate. I hear this all over the world. It's busy, we've gotta deliver results. I just don't have time to innovate. You've got tables. I'm gonna give you four fast minutes. Are you ready? This is the problem. Let's see how many groups can get at least 20 questions in four minutes. If you're answering them, if you're prefacing them, you're talking too much. I've done this enough, I know it. <laughs> get 15 or 20 questions. One person scribes, numbers them. This is the problem. I just don't have time to innovate. Ask every question you can. Why is it a problem? Go, go, go. Four minutes. OK, thank you. Here we go. We don't have time to get into the details of your questions, but I have a question about your questions. How many of you see this problem, I just don't have time to innovate, a little differently after asking nothing but questions? Hands up, you see it a little bit differently. Can you look around? Uh, more than half the hands are up. And all I'm gonna suggest here is that if you do this about the problem you don't have a solution to, you can get the same results. And once you get that done, it's prioritize the questions that matter and then get to work trying to answer them. And this is what I've done recently with Ahmed Bozer, who runs all of Coca-Cola outside of the US. Top team, top 30 people, got them in a room, groups of five or six, they got 100 questions about a strategic issue, each group. We had literally 700 questions. We sorted through which questions mattered to go get to work. Earlier last year, I was meeting with B. Perez, the global sustainability officer, chief sustainability officer at Coca-Cola. We were talking in her office, and she had an issue. I'm like, B, let's take four minutes, do this thing. And we did it, and she saw it differently. She didn't solve it, but she saw it differently. Trust me, try it, and if it doesn't work, email me. <laughs> I'm serious, try it. Now, here's what we know. Questions without work get nothing. They're just annoying. <laughs> if somebody's always asking questions, but they're not willing to do the work to answer them, they're annoying. And when we get out to answer them, we either observe, or we network, or we experiment. And we have a preference for collecting data. And if you're going out to solve a problem, do you like to watch and observe, network and talk to people, or experiment and just try stuff? Observers, stand up real quick. Stand up, observers. That's your preference for getting data. I go out and I watch the world. There's got to be more than three of you. Stand up. I know this. There's a lot of beef. Observers, that's your way of getting data. OK. Down. Networkers, you talk to people. Up, 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 up. Excellent, down, okay. Experimenters, you try stuff. Way cool, I love it, I love it. There are more experimenters in this room than I've ever seen before. This is fantastic. The notion is any of these will help us get new ideas. Let's talk about several of these and, and focus on them for just a moment. Here's a story about how observing and networking and experimenting all came together to make a tremendous difference. So Doug Dietz is an engineer by training He's trying to figure out how to do CAT and MRI scanning machines so that they work well, and they function well, and they look great. He works for G Healthcare. And they got the systems done. Anybody had been into a CAT or MRI scanning machine? Anybody, would anybody love to do it again? <laughs> I mean, they're not comfortable. But they work, and they're important, and, and these are usually around really critical issues in our lives. So Doug was scheduled with his team to get an award for these machines. And he happened to be, for the first time, at a children's hospital in the radiology department where the machines were. And he saw for the first time a child go through this. The radiologist asked him to step out. He did. He saw the parents with a seven-year-old girl walking towards the room. As she got close, she started to cry and then resist and then fight. 
She did not want to go into that room. They had to call somebody to sedate her, and then they strapped her onto a bed and put her inside of it. Doug had never seen this. He had no idea that his machine was doing that to kids. And then he discovered that 80% of the kids who go through them had the same experience. And then he discovered that that little girl had cancer. And that's why she knew exactly what she was getting into, because she'd been there many times before. It hit Doug deeply, deeply. But then he's like, what do I do? How do I get a better solution here? I've been paying attention to how do I get a good technical image, and I've missed something. He then goes and he learns with his team how to be better observers, how to be better networkers, and talking to people to get new ideas. He goes with his team to then try to figure out, you know, how can we just try stuff quickly, fastly, cheaply? How can we do that? And then he goes and does it. Because innovation is work. It means I've got something I care about. And he cared about this in a way he never had before. He wanted to create a solution for those kids. So then his team, they, they go to work. First off, they go to a children's hospital again. They get on knee pads as if they were children. And they go through the hospital as if they were a kid from the front door back to the radiology department, into the system, and then out. You see things differently from down here than you do up there. And then they go to the homes with the kids before they ever get to the hospital to understand what's going on emotionally, psychologically, in a family. And then they go with the kids home after the hospital. What's, what's going on at that point? Then they go and talk to people who are not like them. They're not engineers. These are people who are different, and that's what innovators do. They go and talk to child psychologists about what's the deal here? And the deal is babies even want voice and choice. They want to have a voice. They want to have a choice. That's why they're crying. And they had to figure out, how do we do that in a CAT scanning machine? Then they're like, where on the planet Earth do, do kids get processed at high volumes and they're having fun? Now, one option might have been Disneyland, but they didn't go to Disneyland. They went to science museums where kids are engaged with something. And they went to preschools where kids are engaged. And then they put all of this data, this work, and this data collection together to figure out what's a different way. Here's their solution. It's the GE Adventure series, where you transform that experience into an adventure, truly an adventure. Different kind, space, this happens to be a pirate adventure. In this one, the kids get a little comic book before they ever get to the, to the hospital. It's like, here's the adventure you're going on. These are the characters you're going to meet. And it's just like an exciting journey. They get to the hospital in the pirate adventure. They get a pirate hat put on when they get to the hospital. And the staff starts telling them about the journey they're going on. And at one point in the journey, the ship is going to make some very loud boom, boom, bang, bang noises. You know those noises in those machines? But they're telling the kids, that's when the ship's going into hyperspeed, super fast, so just hold still. And when they're all done, the kids get off the machine, they get a prize out of the treasure chest, they swing the monkey right there, and off they go home. What are the kids saying on the way home? When can I go back? I'm serious. Here's what Doug Dietz said after having gone through that whole experience. Why, did, why I really wrapped myself around this and, and tried my best to pull in some of the best people that I could to, to work with me is that I always kept in my mind that frightened child that was going through cancer or that was really having some problems going through their scan. And that is such a tough thing for a little one. It's such a tough thing for a family. And I did put my heart and soul behind it. And it... It means a lot to me now that we have a solution and that the solution is helping the way it is and it's helping these families. Um. I, I appreciate your honoring of Doug. Um, 
If you don't mind, I, I apologize, but this is personal for me too. Um, my first wife passed away from breast cancer, and then I remarried and she got breast cancer. And so these places are not pleasant to me. And they may be, I'm sure there are people in the room right now who are maybe going through some of the same stuff. And, and please talk to me if, if this is evoking some emotion you didn't expect. I didn't fully expect this. Here's the issue. Doug was an engineer, but until he got out of his office and into the world with his team, to understand the emotional world of the people going through this stuff, it didn't really work. And once it did, it worked. And I went to the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and, and Kathleen Caspin was one of the people who helped with this whole process. And Kathleen told me, she said, as a radiologist, my question before we started this whole innovation process, my question was, how can we get the best technical image of these kids? She loves those kids. And she said, by the end of it all, our question changed. Now all we care about, how can we make the experience safe for these children? And if they answer that question, which is the right question, they get everything else falls into place. Can we skip to the very third to last slide? It's called Make a Difference, please. It's about making a difference. Innovation is about caring about something enough to do something about it. And the doing is, I'm going to ask different questions until I figure out an answer. I'm going to get out of my office and actually observe like an anthropologist. I'm going to intentionally talk to people who are not like me. This is an event with over 1,000 people in this room. They're not like you. Talk to them. I'm going to actually try experiments that are small, fast, and cheap that lead to solutions that work over and over and over. These are the skills that innovators use. This is the stuff that the Jeff Bezos of the world does, the Steve Jobs. Anybody read Steve Jobs' biography? If you were to reread it with the lens of questioning and observing and networking and experimenting and this associational thinking, every second or third page, Steve Jobs was doing it, wasn't he? And what, it, what we know from our data is that innovative leaders, innovative CEOs, and innovative companies, by shareholder sort of premium we talk about, innovative leaders in those companies spend twice as much time as non-innovative leaders doing exactly what we talked about. Not delegating, but doing it themselves. That means that's 18 years when I'm in my mid-50s of doing this stuff versus nine years, which means that's why they get the better ideas. So it's never too late to start doing this. That's my, that's my suggestion on this one. Now, the second part about making a difference is, if you use these skills actively to solve the problems you care about, you have a team around you who is watching. And as you start provoking and challenging the status quo about things that matter, they will. Because these behaviors are visible. They're not things you just do in an office. You get out there, and you engage, and you get uncomfortable. And that makes a difference in that world. And can I share a final place where I would suggest that we make a difference? This conference is, in one sense, about disruptive innovation, and it's about you. But what we learned from all of these innovators we interviewed is that almost all of them had adults in their lives when they were growing up that helped them keep these innovation skills alive. Help them ask better questions as kids. Help them observe the world better. Help them talk to people who weren't like them comfortably. How many of you had somebody like that in your life? A lot of people. Can I just tell you quickly about a person in my life? It cycles back to photography. His name was Eldon Hewitt. And when I was 15 years old, I started taking pictures and took them to the local Walgreens store. And then I got better and good enough and started making money with it that I took them to Midvale Camera, a little Photoshop with Eldon Hewitt as the owner. Eldon was a short guy, little glasses, kind of interesting fellow, but he paid attention to me, a teenager. He taught me the craft, how to take better pictures. He lent me his professional cameras. He took me into the darkroom and taught me how to do this stuff so I could do it. And I didn't realize until a couple of years ago that I had never gone back to tell Eldon thank you for doing all that stuff that kept my innovation skills alive. 
I went online, looked it up, and discovered that Ellen had passed away a year before from a heart attack. And then I'm like, crud. Um, and my friends, I was talking to them, and they said, well, you know he's married, you know he's got kids, tell them thank you. So I went back and I ended up looking on the internet, discovered where his wife lived, went to his home when I was traveling through the western United States, and knocked on the door. Run down sort of neighborhood, steel bars on the door and the windows. She opened the door and you could tell it was a year later from his, her husband's death. She, you could tell that it had been a long year. I explained the situation, I'm a stranger, and she finally was willing to let me come in. She, she got it that I knew her husband. And then we sat down and I learned something that I didn't know. That what Eldon had done for me, he had done for dozens of other young people. He was never rich, he was never famous, but he meant everything to my life. And as you walk out those doors today, I promise you, they're gonna be kids, teenagers, young people, whatever, in your home or your community, who are gonna need you. Not just your companies, but the people around you. I'm gonna finish with this final image. Um, this is um, me taking a picture of my granddaughter. Her name's Stella. And I remember I had the camera up high, she was down low, I was snapping these shots, and it wasn't until I processed the images later that day that I realized how deeply she was looking at me. Can you see it in her eyes? And, and that's the image I want us to remember, which is innovators, innovators and innovation are a set of skills that people can see. And this may sound totally self-serving, I get that. But her world is going to be harder than mine unless something changes. And she is going to need these skills more than I do. So as you go forward, please try them, experiment with them, see how they work for you, and then reach beyond, make a difference, because they need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.